Good evening and welcome to another half hour homage to the god of drivel. In the news this week, <laughs> new footage of Mrs. Thatcher fuels concern as to why Dennis hasn't been seen around for a few weeks. <laughs> in America, there's good news as a donor organ is found for Dan Quayle's brain transplant. <laughs> And in London, the reason behind this week's serious congestion on the Bakerloo line is finally revealed. <laughs> on Ian Hislop's team, a comic actor who was recently quoted as saying, I'd love to play a bastard. Well, tonight he's got the chance to play two. <laughs> Peter Cook. And on Paul Merton's side, the man responsible for the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy radio series, TV series, audio cassettes, calendars, mud trees, bath mats, musical socks, and some may even remember book, <laughs> Douglas Adams. It's not brown, that jacket, is it? <laughs> I'm uh, delighted to say it's not even remotely brown, Paul. I chose it, it specially. It just looks brown on you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So, <laughs> uh, so let's hold our noses as we jump feet first into round one. Two pieces of news-related visuals per team, behind which lie four major stories. Ian and Peter, chapter 97. Oh. <laughs> the future Queen of England. <laughs> and some bloke she married. <laughs> They are splitting up for tax reasons. <laughs> and I think the whole royal family are doing that. The, the Queen and the Duke are the next to go, so they can all have separate palaces which count as a single dwelling for... <laughs> <laughs> for, for each person. Yes. Mm. No, the, the sad thing, I, I read in the Express, actually, that mm. um, about uh, Princess Di, she attracted beautiful young men like moths. <laughs> and so poor Charles had all these people flapping at the windows <laughs> as soon as they turned the lights on. Uh, <laughs> there's nothing worse than a man like a moth just uh, mm. flapping out yeah. your window. There's awful little things uh, yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. And they won't go away. They won't go away. Yeah. Mm. Shouting squidgy through the window. <laughs> It has absolutely no constitutional uh, ramifications whatsoever. So we gather. Um, I mean, it's not important if a man's divorced, why shouldn't he be head of the Church of England and king? <laughs> there is um, no what, what happens if Charles murders people? Not important. <laughs> not important? No, not important. No. No. According to uh, Norman St. John Stevens, now Lord Forsley, not constitutionally important. <laughs> Especially well, if he murdered uh, Norman St. John Stevens. <laughs> Yes, it is uh, the extraordinary unexpected announcement that uh, Charles and Diana are to separate, uh, turning the Queen's Annus Horribilis into an Annus Bloody Catastrophicus. <laughs> uh, John Major, however, made it clear that Diana could still be crowned, presumably if she goes anywhere near Prince Philip. <laughs> uh, despite the split, Diana has been uh, invited on a Boxing Day shooting party by the royal family. She's going to be given half an hour start. <laughs> Paul and uh, Douglas, a small family affair. Oh, Princess Anne is going to marry all these people <laughs> in the hope that one of the marriages will work. <laughs> oh, she's getting divorced. <laughs> Princess Anne's getting married on Saturday and the, and the Queen Mother's not going to go. Oh, she, yeah, is, she is. Oh, she's, she's going, yeah, she's she? She's jogging up there. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. It says the hastily arranged royal wedding between Princess Anne and Commander Tim Lawrence. Uh, Anne is uh, to get married in a simple bridal outfit, just a couple of blinkers and a set of reins. <laughs> um, Ian and Peter, what ratings war is this? This is Operation Drop Clinton in it. <laughs> um, and it did. Yes, it is. It's the American forces' uh, arrival in Somalia, described by the military as an invasion, by the Pentagon as a landing, and by the TV networks as a seaside spectacular. <laughs> uh, naval commandos uh, stormed ashore and, after a brief 60-minute battle, gained control of the airport from NBC. <laughs> U.S. Marines are now fanning out across the country and have orders to shoot on sight anyone they see with a gun. Knowing U.S. Marines, that means each other. <laughs> Uh, Paul and Douglas, a heartwarming story of a man and his rabbit. Well, a man playing snooker with the unbars. 
Uh, this is, uh, we, um, rabbits are being allowed to keep maximum security prisoners. <laughs> <laughs> Very dangerous criminals are being allowed to keep rabbits. Um, because apparently there's been a problem with the rabbit. The rabbit has, rabbit has been kidnapped by another couple of very dangerous prisoners who are holding it to ransom for two tins of ginger beer. But the guy who as originally is the keeper of the rabbit, who has been trained to be a softer, gentler, more kind person, mm. has threatened them that unless they give back the rabbit, he'll knife them. <laughs> well, two tins of ginger beer just aren't the same as a rabbit, are they? <laughs> yes, it, I mean, a perfect answer. It is uh, a prisoner, Sammy Ralston, who you saw in the film, is the owner of Lucky, the rabbit. Not sure how lucky a rabbit would consider itself <laughs> being locked up for ten years with a Glaswegian armed robber. The uh, scheme's vet, Elizabeth Ormerod, uh, said that animals were ideal for breaking down barriers. Uh, perhaps that's why there would be so many requests for rhinoceroses. <laughs> uh, pets are being provided you for murderers. You thesis on this, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Ernest Saunders have a rabbit in uh, in the carnal sense. In, no, in the, no, not no. in the carnal sense. In oh, the right. open prison. <laughs> Anybody who's interested in rabbits and prisoners will have a good time with this program. <laughs> 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 Which uh, bestial nonsense sweeps us uh, majestically to the end of this round, and the sad truth is that uh, both sides are uh, straining equally at the leash, Ian and Peter and Paul and Douglas having a level four. Fans of round two will have to control themselves a moment longer while we introduce the initial stages of our caption competition. Ian and Peter, this one's for you. <laughs> Paul and Douglas can have this one. <laughs> so, uh, the unbridled joy that is round two starts here. One tabloid folly per member. Paul, there's a clue here if you can spot it. Sex therapy for a man who fell in love with the family car. Um, is this them about um, them putting up um, council rates in Swansea? <laughs> This is the story of the week. Mm. A man uh, who had had not much success with women fell in love with the, um, the family car, which is an Austin Metro, so you can, you can understand it. Yeah. <laughs> and he it used to, to take it into the woods and have sexual relationships with this car. Um, <laughs> the exhaust pipe, presumably. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, the exhaust pipe, all sorts of... And, and the back seat with nobody else being there. Mm. Mm. And, and um, apparently... <laughs> I don't know if we're allowed to say, we're, uh, uh, I don't know what sort of details we're allowed to go into. Um, mm. But, um, <laughs> I'd go I'll, for I'll, it if I were you. Yeah. But apparently, <laughs> I'll let you know. Then, uh, but apparently a sex therapist mm -hmm. basically has been trying to wean him off the car by encouraging him <laughs> to masturbate with the car, but at the last moment, nipping in a picture of, an, of a naked woman in the hope <laughs> that give him an idea of the direction he mm. should be going. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> You yeah, tell no. them if you got your pictures wrong or something. <laughs> <laughs> and you shared a packet of digestive biscuits. <laughs> totally embarrassing in mm. the supermarket, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly you get an erection by the hobnobs. Yes. It is the story of George, his name is, uh, who developed a close erotic relationship with the family Austin, Austin Metro. <laughs> uh, it all started when George began masturbating inside the car. Must have made overtaking rather dangerous. <laughs> um, he was... Uh, Missed up his windows as well. <laughs> <laughs> that was the very word you were trying to avoid. Yes, yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> That's precisely what you can't yeah. get away with. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Douglas, what's behind the sweat smell of success? Um, apparently there is some part of the year, which I think it must be about now yeah, actually, when, time, when yeah. men sweat more than at other times of the year, because yeah. this is meant to be sexually attractive. The new number plates come out this time of year as well. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mm. Yes, it, well, it is, uh, it is the theory of scientist Dr. David Kelly that male sweat is more attractive to women than aftershaves or body sprays. According to Dr. Kelly, men are naturally at their sexiest this time of year because there's five times the usual amount of pheromones in the pores. It's also because there's five times the usual amount of lager in the bloodstream. <laughs> 
So uh, any man who wears the same pair of Y fronts 70 times in a row must be amazingly attractive to beautiful women. <laughs> Last, the mystery of Michael Winner and Jenny Seagrove is explained. <laughs> Peter, a definition of the British judicial system for you. Justice is a ferret down the trousers. I fear this is a Welsh story, but Mr. Di David... Oh, I won't try this accent, I don't think. It, 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 uh, no, oh, I thought it was going rather well. Or <laughs> well, if you like Pakistani impression. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, uh, well, I, know, I know you're a sucker for it. It's better than sweat, isn't it? But... Um, <laughs> It's a vigilante group in Wales, in Powys. It is. In Powys. That's yeah. Wales for you. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, this is, uh, this is going down well in Wales. They, they, <laughs> anyway, they call themselves the 12 Dash Men, and mm -hmm. if they catch somebody in their view doing something illegal, rather than turn him into the police, in their charming Welsh way, they put a ferret <laughs> down his trousers to mm. teach them a sharp lesson. Yes, it's the 12 Just Men, a vigilante group in uh, Newton Paris. Paris. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who've uh, announced that any local criminals they catch will be frog marched to the hills and a vicious ferret named Fred will be forcibly inserted into their trousers. Apparently if it sees a juicy thigh it gives a nasty nip but if it sees what looks like another ferret, the consequences are far, far worse. <laughs> In preparation for his uh, next vigilante film, Michael Winner agreed to have a number of ferrets stuffed down his underpants. The ferrets later had to be brought round with smelling salts. <laughs> uh, Ian, a, uh, a near miss for you. Saudi cane ordeal. Um, some expat working um, in Saudi Arabia who failed to follow the local customs and was swooped on by the religious police sort of Islamic version of the Welsh boys, um, <laughs> who don't come and put a ferret down your trousers, they give you a hundred lashes with a cane. Hmm. There was an appeal from the Foreign Office. And they gave him two hundred. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Um, Ex-Pat David Brown, in fact his name was, who was uh, sentenced to fifty lashes by a Saudi Arabian court for calling two hospital workers bastards. Thank God he didn't run into any estate agents out there. <laughs> Under uh, Saudi law, the judge could have doubled the punishment if the appeal failed, or have his accusers flogged if he decided the other way. Isn't this directly lifted from 321 with Ted Rogers? <laughs> to, uh, to lessen the force of the flogging, Islamic law required the flogger to hold a pita bread under his armpit throughout, after which it's immediately flown to the kebab machine in Piccadilly Circus. <laughs> Which uh, Arabian delights bring us to the end of our anti-pre-penultimate round. And the facts are that, uh, well, neither team has dared to take pole position, both being neck and neck with eight points apiece. And so we blow the nose of time and examine the handkerchief of history. <laughs> and nothing if not distasteful way of uh, introducing our archive round. Ian and Peter, explain this uh, rather strange assembly. Looks like the audience during your last monologue. <laughs> <laughs> you recognise, uh, you recognise Pete Murray and... Which one was he? The one next to Mara Hindley. No, uh, <laughs> the... It's not Desert Island Disc, is it? Absolutely right, it's not Desert Island Disc. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Desert let's... Storm? <laughs> We're clutching at straws here. Des O'Connor. Let's, uh... <laughs> there you go. Let's see what transpired. Desperate. <laughs> <laughs> that was stars for Thatcher. No wonder we didn't know any of them. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it was. Uh, some of the audience were apparently given tickets from Scotland to London for just one pound in return for attending. By the looks of things, they were ripped off. <laughs> uh, Paul and Douglas and Aquiline, what happened next for you? The Irish Prime Minister, Charles Hockey, was at Shannon Airport to see him off. The return of the six-month-old bird was, he said, a symbol of the friendship between America and Ireland. Well, it's, this is obvious, isn't it? I mean, I mean the, the bird grabs him by the sort of back of the shirt and flies off with him. <laughs> and they've got, and they, and they sort of think, well, hey, we've got to get the prime minister back. So they distract the bird by lowering field mice on pieces of elastic from helicopters. <laughs> and eventually, after a three-week ordeal, my eagle hell, I think he called it later, <laughs> the um, bird uh, left him up a tree. 
Mm. Americans frequently try to sort of cement their foreign relationships by dropping unpleasant objects on people. Is what was inside the eagle just the bird outside <laughs> in a matter of moments? And, and did he try and pass it off as a new hairstyle? <laughs> Let's see how things digressed. But it seems no one mentioned this spirit of friendship to the bird. <laughs> it's, uh, it's an eagle sent from the people of America to the people of Ireland. It makes a change from high explosives. <laughs> um, so we find ourselves uh, deposited at the end of this latest round, and a quick uh, update shows that our sympathies uh, should lie with neither team particularly, because they both have a perfect eight. Well, uh, blow me if it isn't round four, which it is, fortunately, so that saved us all from a rather embarrassing spectacle. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I wonder what happened uh, under that desk. <laughs> <laughs> Very little. Uh, it's got a Sinclair C5 under there, look. <laughs> Odd one out's the name of the game. Four worthy winners. Which one is the Paul Merton? Sorry, uh, which one is the odd one out? Paul Merton? Benito Mussolini, Michael Fish, Jackie Onassis, and Shirley MacLaine. Um, Shirley MacLaine has been all the others in a previous life. <laughs> <laughs> is it, it is Michael Fish, is it? Because, um, oh, I don't know, Mike, um, he's, he's the only one who's got a spitting image puppet of him. Mm. That's desperate. I'm not, no, it is desperate. Uh, Jackie Onassis is the only one who can't remember where she was when Kennedy was shot. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you nice. one for getting Michael Fish, but that's not actually um, the right reason. Uh, the answer is that they've all had mini-series made about them, apart from Michael Fish, <laughs> who's uh, never been the subject of a mini-series, although his jacket has been used as a test card. <laughs> uh, his jacket hasn't been used as a shades of brown colour chart. <laughs> <laughs> is Mussolini having a medical there? Yes. <laughs> in uh, Mussolini, The Untold Story, his part was played by George C. Scott. Well, how can it be an untold story if they told it? <laughs> it was just See, Mussolini, of... The Untold Story, you then don't make the film. <laughs> yes, no, I think you're misunderstanding for comic effect. Uh... <laughs> it was... <laughs> <laughs> I do hope there's no bitterness or unpleasantness. No, no, no. I'm going to go on with the two people up who were up for the same award. No. Well, I'm not bitter. No. <laughs> What's 2% between hardened enemies? <laughs> it's um, the difference between first and second, isn't it? <laughs> okay. In Mussolini the Untold Story, his Have you been sponsored by Mussolini the Untold Story? <laughs> Every time you say Mussolini the Untold Story, another penny goes towards blind <laughs> Labrador. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if he said it again in a minute. <laughs> no. Are you trying to turn this sorry. into a catchphrase? I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not quite as predictable as that. I'll get off the angle. <clears throat> oh dear. <clears throat> right, sorry, where were we? Here we go. Um, <laughs> guess what the next line we're going to do. In Jackie Onassis... <laughs> Douglas, <laughs> and your question, a slightly more obscure foursome for you. The head of Lloyds of London, Peter Middleton, Mary O'Hara, John Selwyn Gummer, and the singing nun. <laughs> the, there are a lot of X's here. John Selwyn Gummer, I think, is about to, is threatening to leave the synod. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Mary O'Hara is an ex-nun. Uh, the singing nun is an ex-nun. In fact, she's an ex-ex-nun. Or, um, because she's, she's died. I said a latex nun. No. Yes. <laughs> uh, as you far know. as I can see, Peter Middleton is the only one who has a, an entirely different relationship with, with, uh, God. With God. I'll give you one for that. Uh, it's because you've got the roughly right the right answer, but not the right person. Um, it's I'm that psychic. all of them, apart from John Gummer, used to be monks or nuns. 
Peter Middleton of Lloyd's uh, left the monastery and now enjoys listening to latest Rolling Stones records and watching Middlesbrough Football Club. Nice to know he still denies himself earthly pleasures. <laughs> uh, Peter, four uh, pretty faces for you. Michael Portillo, mm -hmm. MP. Norman Scott, mm -hmm. Jonathan Ross, and the lovely Patsy Kensit. Have they all just had babies? <laughs> They've all got dogs. They've all got dogs. Mm. Jonathan Ross has got a dog. Mm. Patsy Kenzie has got a dog. And Michael Portillo's dog, woof, woof, you could never miss it down <laughs> in the very park around the street, can you? It's, uh, Portillo's it's... dog they try yes, with. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's uh... The rogue. Much bigger than Patsy's and nicer than Jonathan's, they say. <laughs> Uh, Poor old Norman's got shot. Mm, um, it's all fascinating, but nowhere near the answer. <laughs> um, it's that all of them were child models, except Norman Scott, who was a male model. He, uh, he claimed that the then Liberal leader Jeremy Thorpe and other senior Liberals had tried to have him murdered after a homosexual affair. The hired assassin corroborated the story, but uh, unsurprisingly they were all found completely innocent. Another uplifting saga in the annals of British justice, as annals with one N. <laughs> Michael Portillo appeared in a Ribena commercial which uh, ended with the words each day a little older, a little stronger, a little wiser. Well, two out of three is not bad. Uh, Jonathan Ross appeared in a Winnerlot commercial, although before that the product name had been Rinnerlot. <laughs> and uh, finally in this round, Ian, four uh, household names for you Sir Dennis Henderson, Paul Henderson. Sir Roy Watts and Sir Peter Holmes. Thank you. Not at all. They're all called Henderson, except the last two you mentioned. <laughs> the man in the top right is called Paul Henderson, who was the defendant in the Matrix Churchill case. Well, I'll... Uh, They've I'll... all got knighthoods, you mentioned these other blokes. Not they the they must have been true. knighted for services to the Conservative Party, as opposed to being attempted to put in jail for services to the Conservative Party. Um, the answer is that three of them run companies which have been found guilty of serious breaches of the law, and curiously the government knighted all three, uh, whereas uh, Paul Henderson runs Matrix Churchill, which was found completely innocent, and curiously the government tried to send him to jail. Uh, Sir Dennis Henderson chairs ICI, who were fined £12 million for setting up a prices cartel, and also dumped high-velocity explosives in Scottish fishing grounds. Trawler men who dragged it up uh, thought it was a cooking fat, although they became suspicious when they put the gas on and their sausages cleared the after deck. <laughs> uh, Sir Peter Holmes runs Shell, who were fined a million pounds for deliberately pumping 150 tonnes of oil into the Mersey in order to save a section of fractured piping. And Thames Water had to pay £100,000 after a sewage works severely polluted the River Kennet. Their chief, Sir Roy Watts, gave £50,000 from people's water bills to the Conservative Party this year. Thank goodness there was no connection between that and his knighthood, or people might think the honour system in this country was corrupt. <laughs> Which uh, somewhat polluted atmosphere engulfs the uh, end of this singular round, and the story so far is that... Uh, well, Ian and Peter stumble onwards with nine, while Paul and Douglas are coasting to victory with ten. And so we round the final bend and enter the home straight as the climatic missing words round hoves into view. Two groups of depleted headlines, in what words are they deficient? So, Ian and Peter, you're currently uh, not first, so uh, you start with Tim, the ideal royal what? Yacht. <laughs> um, Rhymes, jelly. that's not the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> husband. No, husband is the right Mel answer. Husband. Very oh, good. Husband. Uh, next, Norman keeps what, says PM? Gerbils. <laughs> All his receipts. <laughs> Uh, job is the right answer, well done, Paul. Uh, Serbia rules out who as president? Is it, is it Milosevic. Is it Shirley Bassey? <laughs> um, Panic is apparently how you pronounce it. And lastly, London buses to be what next year? Late. <laughs> so no change there then. Uh, no. Privatised. Privatised is oh, that's another good idea. With condoms. Paul and Douglas, here are your batch. I'd love what, says Kylie. Is it a damn good scene, too? <laughs> Ian, 
In a roundabout sort of way, yes. A family is, in fact, the answer. Uh, uh, BBC loses £60 million pounds in what? All-night poker game. <laughs> It's a accountancy count muddle, yeah. Cash bungle is, in fact, the answer we were looking for. Next, Fergie does what in search of a new image? Signs for West Bromwich Albion. <laughs> Fergie marries Charles. <laughs> <laughs> Treads on eggshells is rather well, baffling answer. <laughs> and finally, Anne and Tim have already had what? Douglas Hurd. <laughs> Honeymoon. Honeymoon. Anne and Tim have already had Financial advice. Honeymoon is the perfect answer. Divorce. Which, uh, furious <laughs> attempt. <laughs> <laughs> With furious attempt at conjecture signals the welcome end of this verbal skirmish. And sad to say, this week's uh, humble pies are Ian and Peter with 11, and this week's Knickerbocker glories are Paul and Douglas <laughs> with 17. <laughs> Before you go, a swift uh, once over of the caption competition. Ian and Peter, you had uh, this to ponder. Serrano is saying something interesting like, get me a cup of tea, boy. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, actually... And Edward is saying, well, I'm not sure if I can, but I'll give it a jolly good go. <laughs> <laughs> is that Jason Donovan in the background? No. no. It's a, it's he wouldn't be it's hanging it's around it. Prince Edward. Good <laughs> grief. <laughs> I think, well, well, why, I think why, why wouldn't he? Because <laughs> well, he doesn't suck up to the royal family. I think you're right. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Paul and Douglas, let's have a look at yours. Um, she's saying, who's this fat bloke? <laughs> <laughs> That's the royal wedding. Tim Lawrence, Anne and the Queen Mother's turned up. <laughs> uh, who's that with the old cow? <laughs> <laughs> Is this the Queen Mother judging a rather unusual heat and come dancing? <laughs> quite, quite possibly. On is which, is uh, this is saying we're living separate lives. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be seen together in public, obviously, me and the fat bloke, but, you know, we're not going to do stuff together. Mm. We have separate palaces separate and courts, um, I'm going to so. be Queen. Mm, with no constitutional ramifications. Which there aren't. Being mm. a cow, no reason why I shouldn't be Queen. <laughs> author of the Andrew Morton book will attest. On which uh, scurrilous note, <laughs> we uh, say thank you to our guests, uh, Ian Hislop and Peter Cook, Paul Merton and Douglas Adams. At the same time next week, don't fail to miss our Christmas review of the year. But for now, I leave you with the news that Arsenal Football Club have found a new way of breeding strikers. <laughs> Although Diana's lost her Mercedes in the split, the royal family show there are no hard feelings by providing her with an alternative vehicle. <laughs> and and David Mellor, by the look of it. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, John Selwyn Gummer spots a woman priest in the Forest of Dean. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>